I'm, I'm starting with something extremely bland because I did look um, on YouTube and I saw uh, the announcement in the, uh, preceding the lecture on the Danai <clears throat> that some of the content might not be suitable for children. So I think we can just look at names here for a moment if, while I get started with Aphrodite Venus. Um, this hour will be different from the previous three, where you certainly did see a lot of Zeus, Jupiter, but you saw him in the form of gold coins and eagles um, and swans. Um, this time, almost all the images will focus on what is the image of Aphrodite rather than on the stories in which she's involved. While, oh, I'll, let's go, I have to give you one thing to look at. I have to have something to look at. So we'll take this. You say, what? That's Aphrodite? Well, yes, it is. And in fact, this is in the Metropolitan Museum. It's in the um, collection of Cypriot antiquities, and it's a fourth century partial limestone statue of Aphrodite. And how would you know that? Well, you'd have to squint at this for a long time. But then you would see there's a little bit of a body here and a little arm placed quite casually over her breast. That's the infant Eros or Cupid, her, her child. But other than this, you wouldn't think of this as an image of, of Aphrodite. But I'll leave that on while I say just a little about Aphrodite, then tell you something about the significance of this sculpture and the other ones in that collection at the Met and then we'll really launch into looking at her. Aphrodite is um, evidently an imported deity from the Near East. One way, one sort of that evidence for that is that in the eighth century BC, which is when there's the first real surviving literature, written literature, from Greece, you have Homer writing, and then at the same time, a poet named Hesiod. They both mention Aphrodite, but they give completely different uh, stories about her origins. <clears throat> and that suggests that she's not someone with a deep uh, indigenous history, uh, but there are features about her that link up with Astarte, Inanu, Ishtar um, as a fertility goddess. Um, often they have um, doves sacred to them. They are also warrior goddesses and goddesses of vegetation and goddesses of love. They tend to have um, um, strong streaks of jealousy in them. Uh, so they have some characterological and, and um, their, so their domains are similar. In Homer, uh, Aphrodite is the daughter of Zeus and another goddess named Dione. In Hesiod, there's a far more brutal and very primitive myth, uh, which is that she was born out of the foam of the sea when Kronos, and that's one of the Titans, severed the genitals of his father, Uranus, who was the sky god. So Uranus and Gaia, Gaia was the earth goddess and Uranus is a sky goddess. So, um, Uranus, when the children were born to their um, union, it would keep stuffing them back into Gaia. And so she finally asked the one, um, Kronos to emasculate her husband, which he did. So he took a sharpened scythe and severed his genitals and they fell to the sea and from that the foam was born. There were also several um, kinds of beings born as well. So 
in that myth event, Aphrodite is born from the sea foam and she's sort of wafted ashore onto the island of Cyprus. Now Cyprus is, is a, so always been a kind of a crossroads among multiple cultures. And when you look generally at Cypriot art, it, you'd hardly say that it's even Greek, although Cyprus, of course, becomes part of the Greek empire. <clears throat> and in sculpture like this, what looks hardly Greek about it is, frankly, partly the, uh, caused by the material that's used. Cyprus did not have a good supply of local marble. And this is limestone, which is a much softer material. The implications in sculpture is that therefore, you can't have pieces that project out, or you can't even have folds that sort of like rise in deep ridges and form deep hollows because things break off too easily. So it's always very compact and sort of like a surface design on a block of stone. So that explains this. In a moment, I'll show you um, two other early figures. But before that, as I said I was going to do, I'd say what's important about this, not as an image, not even as an image of Aphrodite, but because it's Cypriot sculpture in the map. Uh, there was a man named Chesnola, C-E-S-N-O-L-A, who was a diplomat and an amateur archeologist stationed on Cyprus. And he amassed an enormous collection of Cypriot art, which he shopped around. The British Museum didn't want it. The Louvre didn't want it. The newly forming Metropolitan Museum did. And there was a uh, collection of funds and they bought this in the late 1870s. So when around 1880, the Met as we know it there on Central Park um, was opened its doors, the Chesnola collection was the primary material that was in there. I'll give you just one little anecdote about this. You're gonna get a lot of stuff that's really getting into the weeds of archeology span today. But uh, <clears throat> I think you can see here, that is a head that's been attached to this body. Well, in sculptures, stone, limestone, marble, whatever, in any sculpture, one of the areas, if something has tumbled to the ground, the area where there's gonna be likely break is at the neck, because that's thin, even when she has it veil over her head. So Chesnola and his companions, they had a collection of heads and they had a collection of bodies and they just put them together. And <clears throat> not knowing exactly which one went to which, but th this would, this suited. So early visitors to the new Met when it first opened, walking through the sort of like long alley formed by Chesnola collection on either side, remarked about how bees would be buzzing around the necks, almost like necklaces, because there was honey in some, some, some of the fixative they, they used to put them on here. Well, so that's for her. So she's supposedly born from, uh, uh, she comes to shore on Paphos, which is on Cyprus. The curiosity is that this statue which is one of the earliest Cypriot statues that shows the Aphrodite, as we know, with an eros, is not until the fourth century. And certainly the legend of her, her being there was much earlier, but there's no surviving imagery. The earlier surviving imagery is of great goddesses. And let me show you two other, oh, this is a little statuette in the Louvre. Um, I'm not sure. It looks to me like it's made out of alabaster. <clears throat> and this is of the goddess Astarte. The, and you can see she's a moon goddess. But that's, she was one of the early nude fertility goddesses. And she, she's made very alluring here with her jewelry and her inset eyes. And I want you to see her hairstyle because we're going to find Aphrodite with that hairstyle. So she's probably one source for the imagery and also the um, conception of Aphrodite. And then Aphrodite continues in various places to have different guises than the way we're going to concentrate on her. 
in fact, this is from second century AD, um, the great city of Aphrodite, Aphrodisias in Turkey, where I do hope some of you have been. Um, there was a great temple to her there. <clears throat> and this is a reproduction of what the cult statue was. Oh, look at this. I mean, where's that sexy lady that we expect to see? She's in fact covered in a kind of a sheath that tells famous stories of the life of Aphrodite on them. Um, but this is, a, again, a, a, an assimilation to another Near Eastern goddess. So that's about all um, we're going to take of her early various sources and forms. I believe if everybody listening is uh, um, part of the common humanity, um, I, I would think that you generally think of Venus as a, a good goddess because she's of sexuality and of love that she's shown as nude. But initially she wasn't, just as in the ones, the two that you've seen of her in that odd garb and then in, in Cyprus that she's fully clothed. Um, certainly that was true in sculpture and in the early paintings of her in mainland Greece as well. So here's, here's a pot from the fifth century. And here's, her name is written up here so we can be absolutely sure that's meant to be Aphrodite. Uh, a comely young woman in a sheer dress. Uh, and what she has here is a mirror. She's admiring her own beauty. And the three other women here who are almost her attendants are like the, the three graces. And this bird mm, might be a swan. I think it's intended to be a swan. Swans and doves are both attributes of hers. She appears on many, many pots. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Is that an Aphrodite or is that meant to be a bride getting ready for her wedding? It's really helpful if there's something else like the swan or Eros with it to, to identify her. That's in this one. This is a fifth century. This is the interior of one of those drinking cups, a, a, a kind of unusual one that was a, a, a painted white inside. And here she is riding on a rather goose looking swan, but th there she is as a swan and you see how fully bedecked she is in this charming flower sprigged dress and this goddess of vegetation. Um, and there were actually flocks of birds kept in her honor. Um, and then she's her hair up in this kind of a snood, um, very modest in appeal. Uh, this is a Roman copy, probably maybe the first century after the birth of Christ, of another type of Aphrodite. Uh, she goes by the nickname of Aphrodite in the gardens because there were several precincts with temples um, dedicated to her. Were there wonderful groves around there, shady groves where you could picnic and her priestesses were and, uh, and there were birds and flowers. And this is the image associated with it, uh, where she's very chastely dressed, although she's wearing this uh, expensive sheer uh, fabric. But uh, this gesture, when she has the veil over her head and she's pulling it slightly forward like that, is an indication of modesty. And that's also sort of like a gesture of a bride. There's a better um, copy, although headless here, where you see her pose and you see how in drapery, she can still be made to look extremely womanly. So that the drapery clings, you can even see it's indenting into her belly button there. And the nice swell of her belly and how these folds accentuate that and bring you down to the crotch. And then to be sure you know the curve over her legs, you have folds that go over that, they're called sort of like contour line curves. And how the drapery, how her 
breasts protrude, the nipples, it's as if this is sheer, here's wet drapery, and then it hangs from that. So although clothed, you have no difficulty disentangling the parts of her body within that. And you also see a very casual, relaxed, sovereignly in control position that she takes there. So that's still a copy. Um, something that's original from that time and is assumed that one of these is also an Aphrodite. Now, which one? Nobody can know. <laughs> there are no heads left to let. But you see, it's that same style of drapery. Now, utter subtlety and complexity, <laughs> far more so than in the Roman copies. But not concentrating on on her in, in her dressed form. Today it's primarily the either fully nude or partially nude uh, Aphrodite Venus images that we'll be looking at. And uh, this is the, I guess you would say the grandmother of them all. This is the Aphrodite of Cnidus, spelled on um, Greek spelling is K-N-I-D-O-S or C-N-I-D-U-S. It's a um, small peninsula on the southwest coast of Turkey. Uh, it was a prosperous city in, in the Greek era. Um, there's an anecdote about how that city-state was associated with this statue. It's a story probably taught in, in any uh, classical art history you've had. So. For some people, this might be familiar. Um, the, <clears throat> there is, there was a f the preeminent fourth century Athenian sculptor, a man named Praxiteles, who um, later sources repeat, was most famous for the sheer beauty, this melting softness of the surfaces, the fine gazes on figures, just the quality of, of beauty in what he did. You look at this and say, okay, yeah. Well, if nothing else, when you see this strut attaching this piece over to her, here to here, tells it that this is a copy and probably a copy of something in bronze where there'd be no sense of any need for that extra support at that point. So the original Praxiteles uh, made of this statue was destroyed. We know it was destroyed in a fire in Constantinople in the fifth century. All right, but I still haven't gotten to the story of what makes this statue famous. This statue was actually a reject because an island, the island of Kos, which is very close to Cnidus, had commissioned Praxiteles to make a statue of Aphrodite for their temple. And apparently Praxiteles had made more than one statue of her. One of her fully clothed, which would be the appropriate conservative and traditional form in which people would expect to see their goddess. And then he'd taken the daring step of making one showing her nude. Well, Koss was certainly not gonna take the statue of her that was so untraditional, so flagrantly untraditional. And so Cnidus said, oh, we'll take it. And Cnidus set it up in a temple. The temple, there's some, I'm gonna show you a temple which may have been, maybe, may not, where, where it was placed. But this statue was immediately famous and people thronged, um, sort of travelers, not just worshipers coming to see this famous statue. So much so that the, the island was growing so rich off the tourism and was becoming so famous from this that the um, island of Kos, which was more dominant, said, we'll forget all your debts to us if we can have that statue. And the Canadian said, no, we're keeping her. So what's going on? What's the occasion for this? Oh, so this is the first life-size, fully nude, image of a female known in Greek art. So it's the first of a first. But 
that is, how, how did Praxiteles um, justify this? Well, he presented, uh, in, in essence, a story. Because what you have here is um, Aphrodite has either unclothed or is about to dress. Here's her, her garment, which you know their, their clothing might have one or two seams, but they're just basically unshaped cloth. And this would be a big urn, one of those amphoras of water. So she has either just bathed or is about to bathe. And she turns her head because she noticed that someone spies her, sees her. So she's about to wrap herself in this. And that also accounts for the gesture of her hand as she's shielding her private parts. And that accounts for her turn of her head. And then to animate the figure, this is the kind of a convention of male and female figures at the time. You, you bend one leg, so it looks as if the figure can shift from foot to foot and she could maybe shift and turn and move away. So this was the statue. It's, I'm thinking about them. I mean, Praxiteles, he's not gonna know the history of ancient Near Eastern goddesses, but it's very interesting that there are a number of them too who place their hand like this and then the other hand will go up over the breasts. And we're gonna see that in a number of them. With this and then with their hand up here, they're just called the pudicita type or the pudica type. It means the modesty pose for, for, uh, for figures. Now, it may be an indication of modesty, but it also could hardly better signal what's the generative force of this goddess and love. It points right to it. So there's a, a great anecdote that survives. Uh, it sounds like something a tour guide would, would say, but could be plausible. Uh, that uh, one young man among the many so enamored at this image had himself locked in the temple with her at night. And in the morning when the temple was opened again, they found the stains of his passion on her. So that's like, as a story, but there's a, a valuable truth in that as well, because these are not just statues of the gods to the ancient Greeks as they are to us, but they were representations of living being deities who were alive in those statues. So when you went into a temple, you were approaching the God uh, <clears throat> so there, there's a, as I say, this religious part. Oh, uh, one other uh, thing here I should point out. You see this? Uh, this is an armband. That's jewelry. And presumably, originally, she had metal earrings in here. This round building, which is thought to be a temple, there, there's speculation that maybe this is where that statue, the original stood. So that was sort of facilitated, sort of you were encouraged to walk all the way around to see it. But there's, there's no proof that that's the temple to her. Here's proof how much uh, Cnidus uh, capitalized on having that famous statue. This is one of their local coins. Is part of it said Canadian around the sides here. And you can see clearly that's the statue. And here's a colorized, computerized version giving you some idea of what she would have looked like. Uh, we know this from other statues that have been scrutinized really carefully. There are little flecks of red uh, in places. Sometimes the red is an undercolor for something else, but it might have been that she had red hair blue eyes, how's that for an Aryan concept, right? And the red lip and then a gilded um, armband and the original statue undoubtedly that was of a gold one and then the drapery of another color. So that would contrast with the color of her flesh. And here she is from the back. This particular 
one we're looking at is in the um, is in Rome, and you can see this copy was never meant to see from the back because it's even unfinished in this section right there. This head, which is called the Kaufman head after the money that paid for it, uh, is thought to be about the best of what's available. This is just scholar speculation. There's no, you know, no objective verification for any of this. But this Kaufman head, which is in the Louvre, and is much later, maybe about the second century, sometime in the second century BC, is thought to represent more of what a head by Praxiteles would look like. It has better that kind of soft expression, slightly opened lips, and deep almond eyes, and this kind of high forehead and oval face. That's now called a Praxitelian head. She must have been on a long and slender figure. Look at that long and slender neck. Now this is a head that's in the Boston Museum. It's called the Bartlett head. <clears throat> and this is maybe an uh, original that would have some of that same quality it is associated with this circle of Praxiteles. So at least you could see it from the face and the full lips, quite sensuous mouth. You know, I think if someone were to forge an ancient head now, they'd have the sense to do what time has done here. Taking it on the chin, losing the end of your nose, that's to be expected of any face that falls on the ground. This one, there's a, I don't know, you can see a little bit here from this, bit that hangs down there. That was, that had kind of like a tenon or um, a projection there that this must have been plugged into a figure who was clothed. So it, it could not have been on, on one of these nude Aphrodites. But it has some of the allure that they might associate with her. So we're continuing the story of these, these figures. And, <clears throat> you know, when you're dealing with a nude figure uh, of a, a woman who's of a, to be a certain beautiful type, there you have limitations in the varieties of what you can do. Which leg is bent, which one isn't. Slight variations in her proportions, a little change in her hairstyle. Uh, that's what you got to work with. So we're going to look at, so you've looked at that in a different copy. And then we're going to look at this and this one. This one is probably a Roman copy. It's certain here that it's, and this is called the Medici Venus. She appears in, she's a source of many Italian Renaissance painters. And you know from, what's down here that it has to be her because the little supports at the base are a dolphin cavorting in the water and here's her little child Cupid. This one clearly is not. If you've been to the Newark Museum you've seen one of these. This is by the 19th century American sculptor Hiram Powers and it's called the um, Bound Slave. But you see when he did this his source was particularly this one. So we'll start with her. Here she is. So have so this this is a full on, full out modesty pose. The arms on this, one thing that makes a full on, full out modesty pose, is these arms are 16th century restoration. See, it's kind of a hefty arm for that body. And her fingers are very, very long. So finally someone cottoned up, oh, that couldn't be part of the original. I mean, of the original copy. That's a restoration of, of the copy. 
Well, it's called the Medici Venus because it was in the Medici Gardens in Rome. Um, and um, at, at least by the, it had been excavated at least by the beginning of the 17th century, because there is a, a portfolio of drawings of what was in the gardens, and this is there. Um, what, how did it get to Florence and out of Rome? Well, it's because the Pope, Leo, um, I mean, Innocent XI, <coughs> graciously permitted it to be sent to Florence because he said it too much encouraged lewd behavior. So he wanted it out of Rome. So the, the Medici family and the Dukes in Tuscany took it in. Uh, this was from then on so extraordinarily famous. Lord Byron, when he wrote the long poem, Child Herald, which I've never read, don't intend ever to read, evidently wrote five stanzas of that poem, is just extolling her, the beauty of this particular figure. Well, its beauty and fame uh, were such then when Napoleonic troops um, invaded Italy, they took it back to the Paris with them, um, to go into what was called Musée Napoleon. And then after he was, uh, he fell, then it was returned to Florence. So it's traveled around in its day, probably was excavated near Rome, if not in Rome. Statues like this were found, of, of all these um, nude Venus types, could be found in ancient Roman houses, in their gardens, in public bathhouses, in public gardens. Um, they had widespread popularity. Looking at a lot of copies of ancient nude women after a while, I don't know. It's appeal at least Paul's for me. But I, I thought, oh, you're bound to want to see this. This is a painting by a um, painter to um, King George III and his wife, Queen Charlotte, in, in England at the time of the Revolutionary War. And in fact, this painting was painted during the American Revolutionary War by um, an artist who had, had uh, from Bavaria, I believe, but he'd settled in London named Zofani. Z-O-F-F-A-N-Y. And Queen Charlotte, who'd never traveled abroad, commissioned him, uh, who he'd become a court painter by that time, doing all sorts of works for the court, uh, commissioned him to go to Florence uh, and go to the Uffizi, to the grand, it was called the Grand Tribune, it's a room with a kind of an octagonal ceiling, where the Grand Dukes of, um, Tuscany, the Medicis, had the, the premier works in their collection. It's where all Europeans of, of some taste and learning when they're taking their continental, their grand tour, would want to, want to go in to see it. So this is the works, actually, he, Zofani, who spent at least five years doing this painting, he did fudge a little bit, but in ways you wouldn't expect one thing he didn't fudge on, for example, is that even all of the frames in these paintings are precisely the frames that, with the intricate moldings of the paintings that he's reproducing. You may recognize here, some of you, this is a Rubens painting, um, actually of a Venus chasing Mars out. Here's a very famous Raphael. Here's a Raphael that's well known. Uh, all these Greek sculptures are well known. This is the Etruscan sculpture. This I sucked it up and I'm not going to show you other than in this painting. This is a Titian, that famous Venus of Urbino that just flashed on the screen a little in class. And why you're looking at this now, of course, is that here's the Medici Venus. And uh, most of the people in this are uh, portrait heads. Actually, Zafani was later criticized. Ah, you made this painting too busy. You're putting anybody in there. It should be just the queen and the husband and maybe a couple of their kids. 
No, this, he put in everybody who was in Florence. He's in here somewhere too, but I don't know which one. I assume maybe it's this one. But look at the expression of these, these men as they stare up, mouths open, in awe, as they circle around looking at her. There's nobody as wrapped in attention over any of these other works, except this man who's listening as this guy's reading it from his tourist guide. Now down here, this sort of represents a, a kind of conversation of the sort that would be held at, among the um, people who had to justify looking at statues like this. It, and it actually goes back to an ancient um, dialogue, I guess you'd say, or dispute. Which is better, painting or sculpture? So you've got the painted nude and the sculptured nude. And they could be discussing that here. Oh, great, funny painting. Uh, it, it belongs to the Queen. It's in the Windsor Castle collection. And then to what you could see in the Newark Museum, as well as several other places. This is Hiram Powers, Greek slave. And so the face where you'd look at it, although she has the classic Greek profile, the, it's a little bit particularized. It doesn't have the same kind of ideal beauty as the Canadian Venus did, or even the Medici Venus. Now for support, here's a stump draped in a cloth to which she's chained. So let me tell you a little about this statue. And I'm gonna read something from this statue. Um, the original one he did is, was in the 1840s. See, he was an expat, he was from this country, but he, he, he uh, spent a lot of his life in, in Europe. Um, so he made this uh, statue. Uh, it was the first American life-sized or almost life-sized fully nude female uh, in sculpture. And of course, sculpture is far more, has greater actuality than a painting. Par pardon the conversation before about whether painting or sculpture is more important. Uh, <clears throat> so this became very famous and he made a half a dozen copies of it. Two of them were circulating along the East Coast just for people to see them. And um, maybe I'll come back to that in a moment, but here, one of them was at the Crystal Palace exhibition, the first international exhibition held in London in 1851. See, this is the United States collection. This is a piece of vulcanized rubber back here. And here are Indians. And Americans had such a terrible reputation in terms of culture that we were just practical boobs. And, and this statue did a great deal to elevate the uh, European opinion of Americans as people of some artistic and literary culture. This was then a couple years later shown in the Paris International Exhibition. So she's a great uh, advertisement for the US. Now there was, how, despite that, uh, quite a lot of consternation among a, a number of people uh, looking at this, uh, Nude woman. Oh. So uh, Powers wrote a lengthy explanation that was displayed alongside it. And I'm going to read that to you. And then what uh, um, a minister also wrote about it. Because he had to provide a story. As he's not showing a goddess of love here. Oh, no, 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 no. This is the slave. She's been taken from one of the Greek islands by the Turks in the time of the Greek Revolution, which was just a cup. The Greeks won their independence from Turkey just in the 1830s. So this is recent history. Her father and mother and perhaps all her kindred have been destroyed by her foes. And she alone preserved as a treasure too valuable to be thrown away. She is now among barbarian strangers and she stands with intense anxiety, tempered indeed by the support of her reliance upon the goodness of God. 
gather all these afflictions together and add to them the fortitude and resignation of a Christian and no room will be left for shame. So he was really talking about the Christian Muslim antagonism in this. And I didn't bring in a detail, but on her chains, actually there's a little uh, cross over here. So you're to think of her as an en enslaved Christian. I will tell you that many of the Christians, uh, the, the Greeks under Turkish domination had, were, had become Muslims. But anyway, so here she's treated as if she's a Christian. And then you know, since this is from the 1850s, 1840s, these copies, that there's a subtext in all of this, not made explicit by him ever, and I don't know how much it meant to him. It's, it's the condition of, of slaves and emancipation in the United States. But here's then what this, um, in 1847, this Reverend Orville Dewey wrote. The Greek slave is clothed in all over sentiment, sheltered, protected by it from every profane eye. Brocade, cloth of gold, could not more complete, be a complete protection than the vesture of holiness in which she stands. So she's actually returned to some of her, her religious uh, meaning as she had for um, the comedians. Then this is a smaller copy. This is one's in the map. And this is, this is more true to form, see, because this is the part that could break off there on the face, and she's lost her arms. It's only because of her pose and proportions and that little dolphin down there that can we be sure that this is, yes, meant to be another copy of that same Aphrodite that we, we, we call the Medici Venus. This is probably, well, it's about five feet high. It's, um, Roman, maybe the beginning of the second century AD. And another one. Oh, there she is on the side because I have these nice views. Ah, so good that I can actually show you the body from all around. See, the Greeks have been looking at nude men for, for, for ages. Uh, <clears throat> And I think this, I'm just gonna bring this in now, having nothing to do with, with her. Um, for, in, for the ancient Greeks, those, those handsome nude male bodies were not depictions of the men themselves, but they were a cultural ideal that the Greeks believed that if you were morally and intellectually and ethically and physically superior, your body would show it. If you had a fine form, it had to reflect also the state of your mind and your morals. So those statues were actually holding up an ideal of humankind to the Greeks. Um, but uh, they couldn't do anything like that for the women because women were still men's property. So this, with this, it is a more blatant eroticism, but that's then okay because it's only for Aphrodite. Only for Aphrodite. This is another Roman kind of version. They, they play with these different ones. Uh, <clears throat> this great swath of cloth here. Uh, so, so again, as if she's wanting to conceal herself, but of course, where does she bring it to? The same place where your, your focus should go. And there are Greek ones that have this same kind of bonot, foamy hair. It even sort of refers to her hair. Kind of a, that Italian sculptor, we looked at his work before, he, he did the re restoration on her, putting her arms on. And he then uh, actually, um, he, he 
did this so that <laughs> during the period when the real Medici Venus was in Florence, that the, the, the Italians had, had this as the consolation. And then he, he made his own version. Just kind of funny looking. Two totally 19th century koi here. So no sense of the grandeur of a goddess in that. That's just been someone who's been spied in the bath. And yet one or two more you need to see. Um, let's see, where did I? Oh, I don't even know where I put it. I hope you enjoy this while I'm looking at my, <laughs> for my appropriate notes for this. How would we know that this is, a, she has a modesty gesture, but how would we know this is an Aphrodite? Oh, all that's left down here is the foot of a Cupid. This is a late first century AD Roman statue of a Roman aristocratic woman is thought maybe the wife of the emperor Titus, that this became a type that the Romans borrowed. So the Romans are doing as the Greeks with the figures of the men. The body represents an idea rather than the person. And here the idea would be fertility, modesty, both. And what uh, I have some other views of her here, close up. What I think to our point of view is most astonishing, which dates it better than actually, a lot of times you can date sculpture because if they don't have clothing, how, how are you gonna know? It's not in the style of this, you can't see the way it's carved. You don't see marks of tools that would be dead giveaways, but she's got it. This is a hairstyle that was popular then. Now this is a, really slapdash way of doing it in this kind of funny, looks like a wasp nest to me. Here's her head from the side. Look at this. Some of this was wig, but a hairstyle like this is also a way of indicating that you have great wealth. You have slaves who are helping you with your coiffures. And you can see she has a little bit of a double chin here. So the face has some individualizing features to it. And it's thought as perhaps, this is that wife of the Emperor Titus. Perhaps it represents her. And here's another lady from that same time with the Vogue now in a different Venus pose, but that same remarkable hairstyle. The Romans had as much of a reputation of their, their, their standards in the fine arts as the Americans did. Well, we're about to move to another type that you know. That's the Venus de Milo. This is a Daumier print, pretty marvelous, <clears throat> where he's looking at her with great interest and she's looking at him equally. He's a, it's the art connoisseur. He's a portfolio of prints and all these paintings he has around him. So we get on to her. First of all, well, she's the Venus de Milo. There is no attribute left. No arrows, no dolphin, no nothing. No arms to tell you exactly how she was posed. So although she's certainly everywhere known as the Venus, it's not absolutely certain that she is. Well, she came into the Louvre in the uh, 1820s that she'd been a chance discovery um, when she was found on the island of Milos, which is about halfway between Athens and um, Crete. <clears throat> and um, she was given to um, Louis XVIII, who gave it to the Louvre, and it, it immediately became extraordinarily famous and it's thought to be one of the most beautiful statues ever. Um, I'll tell you, and she's 
continued to be this. She was sent to France um, in 64 as a sort of like a art diplomacy. Um, so she was sent to, I mean, sent to Japan. And there were 100,000 who greeted the ship and a hundred and a half million went by her on a moving uh, stairway um, ju just to, to, to see this figure. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen her. She's about seven feet high. Well, not only do we not have proof who she is, but there's no certainty about the date. And I just can, let me tell you this. this, this is, these are scholars talking. Maybe a classicizing late century recreation of a late fifth century original, the face suits the fifth century, but the hairstyle and the modeling of the flesh suits Praxiteles in the fourth century, and the pose and the small breasted body seems like a second century. So just enjoy it for what it is. It's a two main blocks of marble, and then the other parts were attached by um, sort of pegs. Uh, the break comes right, as you would expect, right along the line of her drapery. And in the late 1880s, it was actually moved slightly on it so that she no longer looks so thoroughly twisted as she is in this one. So it's been reconstructed. Is she holding an apple? Um, would she be have a, sh a mirror over here? Was there a shield of her sometimes lover Mars over here, uh, the, the shiny in which she's looking at her face? Mm. Don't know. She had one of those metal armlets and she had metal earrings, and there are just few fragments of color left on her. Nice head. And here she is again. This is Salvador, Salvador Dali's version of her. Uh, it's called uh, Venus with Drawers from the 1936. Um, so what he did to make a surrealist object out of something and uh, in typical surrealist way, combining materials of different sorts, uh, he took a statue, he later makes a number of versions of this. He took it and he cut it. And then for drawer pulls, these are pom-poms of mink. He did some in plaster, some he painted, and this is in bronze that was painted. So he even hides the fact that it's bronze. And his explanation for this, it's really funny, he calls it, it's a piece of living furniture called an anthropomorphic cabinet. And it's a visual pun on something that we know in English. It's the chest of drawers. It's also taught, it's about sexuality because this is, um, this is a comment from Dali. Uh, the only difference between Immortal Greece and contemporary times is Sigmund Freud, who discovered that the human body, purely platonic in the Greek epic, well, I beg to differ there, nowadays is full of secret drawers that only the psychoanalysts can open. So it's about sources and mysteries of, psych, uh, of sexuality. And there's another version with him. versions that I'm sure you know. You're only seeing two of the three here. Uh, uh, Sixth Avenue between 52nd and 53rd. And they're simply called um, looking, um, looking toward the avenue, but they're by the painter, printmaker, sculptor, Jim Dine, who was, uh, lives part-time in New York, uh, um, grew up in Cincinnati, and born in 1935. These are colossal figures. One's 14, one's 18, and one's 23 feet. No doubt but that everybody would recognize what it was. I mean, this is just such a well-known icon of classical art and kitsch and used for everything. Um, and he did, 
several versions of Gershius Masai. This is in the Guggenheim in Bilbao. Three red Venuses. And he's a great lithographer. So here's one he did called Dream Venus. He's known for doing things in great uh, subjects in great series. He did one of tools, bathrobes, and this is a statue that she obviously likes very much. Well, clearly we have to have another class. I gotta go by. Among the in crowd, she's known as the slipper slapper. She's taken off her shoes from the bath and there's a satyr about to attack her. Is the Pompeian little statuette? She's known as the Venus in the bikini. That's a figure of Priapus there who would have a great extending golden phallus to coordinate with her. And then for the last, I'm going to take, if it's all right with you, the next 10 minutes to show you some images of just of the one myth of her birth uh, from the shell, because we have to get Botticelli, don't we? So here's the, on a Greek pot. Here she is in the shell. She's still chastely dressed, although sealed in the shell. And there were little clay figurines, very popular, you would have them in your house. This is probably the third century BC, in Asia Minor, or Turkey somewhere. And those of you been to Pompeii, I'm sure have seen this, this one, in the enclosed garden of one of the houses. This one among the in crowd, which you are now, she is known as Venus on the half shell, where she's, uh, Here's her son, and this is just a little um, sea creature cavorting on her dolphin. This flaring up behind her, that sort of suggests the idea of the heavens. <laughs> this insouciant gesture with that foot, that leg doesn't exactly work very well. <laughs> Looking at her head is quite nice. And there are floor mosaics, of course, you don't get to see her head here. But this floor is like, so over here says Afros, that's uh, sea foam, and this says sea depths. Here, these are, look at those lobster claws, sea deities. And then Botticelli's Birth of Venus. About which, there's a lot of question. This is done around 1485, I think. I'm assuming of anybody, this would be one that you would know. It's, it's big, it's almost five and a half by nine feet. Who exactly it was for and what exactly it means are, are the substance of many scholars continuing to write articles. But you have Aphrodite now on her shell being blown toward Paphos. Here's Zephyrus, the western wind blowing her. And this, she may be one of the graces or the representation of spring who's about to clothe her in this flower sprigged drapery. Oh, you see, he's used that Medici Venus, the Medici pose, utterly altering it in ways you don't expect in the Renaissance in that it's deprived of anything of suggesting weight and solidity. How could she stand on her shell that way? And look at the extraordinary, look at her shoulders. Oh, he's confirmed, turned her into a vision. She may represent an ideal of um, pure love, Christian love. There, there's Neoplatonic philosophy behind this. But uh, I'll give you a couple close-ups. See, he doesn't even do anything to suggest that that's a real horizon where there's as the Venetian knew, all that soft haze that ought to come in there. No, in the water, those are just little repeated patterns. It's crystalline.
You don't see roses, her flowers that are being blown toward her. That terrible, terrible slide. You just see her cloak and you see how Botticelli was. Oh, he relishes those curves. He and Leonardo are men for them. These are all laurel trees. And this is, may refer to Lorenzo Magnificent as possible. That's a nice detail. And this is my best detail. You know, I have so much more, but I'm, I think I'm going to do a little smart alecky thing here and stop almost at the moment because what is this? Well, you recognize this. This is Andy Warhol. Uh, Andy Warhol in the 80s made a series of prints just on the head of, um, let's see, I'll get another one of them. Here's another one. So these are screen prints with different colors on them. So he doesn't do the whole figure because just as Jim Dine, when he, when he did the uh, looking toward the avenue, the assumption is that everyone now knows these figures. They are so famous. You don't have to have the full thing. Uh, you don't need to see the full figure of this Venus, that she's a cultural commodity. Um, she is not a goddess of love anymore. She is just part of popular life in the same way that he'd handled Marilyn Monroe in the 60s. This is by a current photographer named David LaChapelle, who mainly does um, photography of like um, Miley Cyrus, and he used to do Whitney Houston. And he did art photography, so this is his version of her. Done, let's see if I can remember what the, the date for this one is. Um, 2011. And it's called The Rebirth of Venus. So it's a comment on culture, on commodities, on glitz, on antiquity, on sexuality and shows how far we've come with our Greek gods. And I'm stopping, we're not, we're, there are enough images of Aphrodite that we could do a three classes on her. But as I say, I stop, um, that's a, before getting back into Titian and Rubens and all the big guns. So as before, if you have questions or comments, send them my way. Anybody? You're just gonna go in. Okay, Maggie. Yes. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much. Now when I go to the museum, you've taught me to look at pictures in a different way. Right. And this was really informative and interesting. And thank you for putting in all the work to make this thing possible for us. You know, you can hardly imagine how much pleasure I got out of doing this because what did I know about the David Ch La Chapelle? And I never saw that before. So it's like, yes. But it was terrific. Thank you. Yeah. It was Thanks, really Maggie. terrific. Will, yes. I, I, I have, I, this is the bee in my bonnet. We will come back because we haven't done Hercules. Um, we, we've, we've got a lot of serious mythology to weave through the centuries later on. Why not? Oh. It's great. Yeah. Uh, here, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you so much, Maggie. No, 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 no questions? No questions? Okay. Well, if you have questions, sometimes Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. You are so welcome. Goodbye. And we'll be sure to sign up again. Okay. Bye bye. Yeah. Maggie? Yeah. One quick question. Yes. Oh, I'm so happy. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it's, it's about you. Are oh. you a historian? Are you an art history? Or what is Oh, your... yeah. I'm an art historian. Uh -huh. You're an my art specialty, historian. My specialty is late Roman, early Christian art. 
Uh, I've never taught in my life. <laughs> interesting. Did you are, you, are you retired or are you yeah, still? Yeah. I, I, I taught a couple of places and then I uh, spent 30 long years at William Patterson. Yeah. Oh, for goodness sake. Have you, have you been to their art gallery and seen some of their artists? Recently? No. Well, within the last two or three years. No. Yeah, I, I have. They do some interesting uh, shows there. Yeah. And anyway, thank you. Okay. Nothing else? Okay, goodbye. Bye.